before you know, Sunday school class and here today we got about 12, 13 minutes left. Uh, so we're not going to make it very far, but uh, in this class we've been teaching about Christian apologetics. And that whole area of Christian apologetics is just how do we share with uh, people who are skeptical about Christianity uh, what can we do to help them get more comfortable with the claims of Christianity? And so the whole class has been based on how do we talk to others? Uh, as I said from the very beginning, people are opting out of Christianity in huge numbers in our country. Uh, and I flashed this statistic multiple times that about 70% of Americans uh, belonged to some type of church uh, very consistently through the 20th century and then in about the year 2000 uh, every year at least 1% of Americans opts out and that leads us in the year 2021 at 47% of Americans who have some type of religious church affiliation so we went from 70% in the year 2000 which is not that long ago, uh, even though my kids tell me it is a long time ago, uh, to 47% in the year 2021. And if you're writing that data off as COVID-related, all the data uh, was in before COVID ever hit, right? So that's the pre-COVID situation. And let me just tell you, and you guys can observe this uh, around St. Lawrence, like COVID has not helped the church's uh, participation. Right, I think you all know that. Uh, and that's true everywhere. That's not just true at St. Lawrence. So 47% was the pre-COVID picture. So what the whole point of this class is we've got to know some stuff to help people who are ready to hit the eject button. And chances are we probably all know people who are in this uh, category who maybe at one time affiliated as Christians and maybe at one time were people who who prayed and were part of some type of church community, and today they're just not. And you talk to these people, and they're like, man, I got so many options on Sunday morning, you know? Like, why would I go to church? Because I can watch Premier League, and I can go to Starbucks, I can go to golf, I can go to brunch, I can sleep in, right? And those are all great activities. We all, uh, except maybe going to Starbucks, I'm not a huge Starbucks. <laughs> but those are all great activities, and we all love doing all that stuff. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but it just represents, uh, uh, when you listen to people, it really represents that, that their life, their spiritual life isn't very high on their list of priorities. So we've been talking about that over these last six or so weeks, and um, and so just last week we finished this question about you know the, the reliability of the New Testament. We spent probably a month talking about the New Testament's reliability and how do we, with empirical data, evaluate the New Testament. And if you evaluate it the same way you evaluate uh, any other document, then it turns out it's pretty handy and pretty trustworthy. But basically with the New Testament, uh, we get back to the same options that we had uh, when we talked about you know, confronting people in a loving way, and I, and I mean that, and this is really, really key, is like, you know, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, right? So like beating the Christian faith into somebody literally will never work, right? This is a terrible uh, path to evangelism. Uh, the, the best thing to do is speaking the truth in love. We love you. Uh, I love you as a fellow human being, and therefore I want to share with you some life-changing news, some things that have opened my eyes, some things that make a difference to me personally. And that's the best type of evangelism. I think you know that when you're talking about what difference it makes to you as an individual. Like, does your faith in Jesus mean anything to you personally? So, it's all great to have data, and we need to have data, and we need to have some facts in our uh, back pocket as we talk to people, but we also need to speak to their heart, too, right? Like, uh, it, it's not, uh, this is not science class, and so because the faith is not that way, we've got to have both information and then uh, love and respect that go with it. So, you know... We're not going to win the world for Christ any other way. I have a question for you. 
so in your statistic, what age group is it? Is it young people never getting to go to church, or is it people dropping out of church? The people that are in the millennial generation and younger actually opt out at much higher rates than people who are in older generations and baby boomers and all that. So part of this is you got 70% trucking along. It's, it goes up and down, you know, through the <coughs> second half of the 20th century, you know, some years a little above, some years below. But a big part of this is that younger generations in particular from millennials and then whatever, I can't remember the gen, what is it after millennials? Gen Z. Z. So, uh, they particularly have what we're going to look at, which is a very naturalist view of the world versus a supernaturalist view of the world. So they just, they believe in what they can see and they think they've been sold, uh, they've been sold a, uh, a what I'm going to say is, is a lie uh, that is very, very prevalent in our culture. Uh, and the lie, and we're going to get to this, so I'm getting ahead of myself. The lie is that all truth, uh, any truth that's worth knowing, has to be truth that uh, comes to us through the sciences. And any other truth that is worth, uh, that is out there, it, it can, is sort of a secondary thing, you know. Uh, and, and this itself is where we're going in this class to try to sort of examine that. Let me just finish with this. Um, so, you know, uh, we got three options. It's the same thing we got with Jesus. Like, you can either say Jesus is a liar. Uh, he's not who he says he is. He's insane, right? He's, he's just a crazy dude uh, who's saying all these crazy, insane things. Uh, like, he's the eternal son of God. And we know that human beings can't be the eternal son of God. So he's a crazy on the level of David Koresh. Or he is who he says he is. Right? And so we have the same options ultimately at the end of the day available to us about the New Testament, right? Like either these guys are all lying, right? Like all the New Testament authors are all lying. They didn't see what they said they saw. And remember we talked about the importance that the, the authors themselves say that these that they were eyewitnesses to these things. Uh, so they were either lying, they were crazy, right? They were just inventing stories. Um uh, which is weird because there's just so much remarkable agreement. Remember, we looked at all the ancient manuscripts and the volumes and how much agreement there is, uh, or, or they're telling truth. And it's just important to know, like, man, there's a lot of people in on this lie, and you really would have thought that if they were all lying, that when persecutions came, somebody would have broken ranks and said, like, just kidding, we just made this up, please don't kill me. But every single one of them put their life on the line, insisting that what they saw is what they saw. So, right? People don't die for like cleverly concocted, you know, campfire stories. Probably in your life, you've told a few, you know, things that might not have been one hundred percent true. This question about naturalists versus supernaturalists is a really important question. It's where I want us to spend some time. Uh, talking about because either the world is this closed system where everything that happens depends on something else that happens and that's all there is right uh, or, or there is something that can exist outside of uh, the universe and so I don't know if you notice there's a subtle thing happening in our language that I'm hearing a lot which is something like I'm going to pray to the universe Anybody ever heard anybody say that recently? This is, a, this is something that I'm starting to hear more, like uh, the universe will bless us, or I will pray to the universe, right? So, so again, it's just undergirded by this belief that the universe is, is all that there is. There can be nothing outside of the system. And so I want to talk about miracles, uh, because for a person who believes in at least a supernatural possibility, right, that there's something that is uh, uh, above the natural world. That super, in that sense, not meaning like, boy, it's super great, but like super as in, as in above. Uh, something that is uh, outside of the natural system. And so when we talk about miracles, what we say is that there are uh, divine uh, interruptions or interventions, you might say, 
that go beyond natural laws. Uh, they're consistent with nature, but they're beyond natural law. All right, so this question, when you're talking to somebody who's very skeptical uh, about faith at all, or about the existence of God, this question of miracles actually becomes uh, really, really important. Because to believe in a miracle, you gotta believe in the possibility of a miracle worker. All right, so you have to believe that there is a system, and then there's something outside of the system that interrupts it or intervenes in the system of the natural world. So the problem for the skeptic is you'll hear all day long. I mean, I read article after article yesterday that, that there aren't any such thing as miracles. You know, that, that all of these, this huge, huge, huge body of evidence for miracles that is millions and long, that all of these can be explained by natural processes. And, and, and so the problem with the, this is if you start from this, uh, this place before you even begin the discussion, um, that there isn't, there can't be a God, there isn't a God, then of course you can't then admit that there are miracles. All right? So this turns out to be a really important and helpful way to talk to people who uh, are skeptical about our claim, uh, our, our claims. And so if you talk to somebody who's in this category, and there's this huge body of evidence, so we'll look at some of it uh, as we go. Uh, but they have to say that there's a natural explanation for everything that has ever occurred, and there's never been a miracle that has occurred, right? They have to say that, right? Um, and so what, what I want you to know before we just jump in and talk about uh, miracles is that this is really, uh, you'll hear a lot of people say, like, scientifically, you know, that miracles uh, are, are not Possible, but that's not a scientific position. That is a philosophical position. All right, it can't uh, it, it can't be a scientific conclusion. Uh, they may say because of their strong belief in science uh, that they think that everything can be explained by by scientific methods and uh, by natural causes. Uh, but then you say, well. Okay, so explain how you know this person was spontaneously and instantly healed of you know cancer, and they've been given uh, two days to live. Explain how they are spontaneously healed. Literally, the next scan an hour later, as they're walk, about to walk out of the hospital, they don't have cancer. Or explain that from a natural process. And what that person has to do is they say, well, there is a natural explanation, even though we don't know what that natural explanation is. Right, so they have. So this is something that Richard Dawkins, or who's, who's a big-time atheist and he's a uh, biologist, uh, he he would say. So there's a difference here, and this is why I just we only have a well, we're actually over time. So there's a difference between science and scientism. All right, and I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, distinction. And it's a really important distinction to talk to people who are who are naturalists in the world who just believe that everything has has natural causes because uh, this is itself a huge huge error that many in our culture make you Here, here's the error i'll try to summarize it and everybody can get the error is that science is a wonderful thing right and we have learned i mean that the exploration of the sciences has alleviated so much human suffering Right? Everybody who likes their iPhone, and I'm not sure I really like mine, but uh, the fact that you can see this is because we understand how the periodic table of elements behaves, right? It's why you have your, your phone that comes to you. It's why when you cut your finger and it develops a bad infection, you take antibiotics, right? So science has done a lot of wonderful things uh, uh, for the earth, for human beings, uh, alleviated a, a lot of suffering. Uh, my brother, I think you know, is a, is a physicist, a scientist, that this is itself a good and holy pursuit. And so we are in no way, shape, or form against science. But this is not a scientific conclusion that miracles are impossible or that it's impossible for there to be a God. Because by its very nature, what the claim we are making isn't a scientific Claims. Scientific claims 
are observable. You know, uh, this a scientific person would say, you know, okay, this uh, tablecloth has all these creases on it right here in this little pattern, and I can count it and I can observe it. There it is, right? And then I can repeat or, or uh, um, uh, you know, if, if you drop this water bottle, it can be dropped at a certain rate, right? The pull of gravity, right? And we can measure that and we can observe that and then we can make a little note about it, right? And so with prediction over and over again, every time we drop a water bottle, it... saying is there's something outside of the natural world which, uh, which creates the natural world and which lifts up and enlivens the natural world and makes the natural world proceed according to certain processes and principles. And so by its very nature, this isn't something that science is ever going to be able to do. Now you'll read some of these big atheists who are like, science just proves the existence of God. And it just, it can't by its the discipline doesn't allow it to do that, is I guess what I'm saying. The discipline of science is good, but it does not allow the scientist to disprove God because it isn't able to answer that question. It's not a scientific question. Is there a God? Okay? Now, I might be just confusing everybody. I have a feeling that I am. Uh, but this itself, uh, we can observe that there are miracles. We can say we don't know. Uh, what the explanation for it is, but the person who denies that there could be a God has, says there just has to be a natural explanation. And that itself is a statement of faith in science. So scientism is an exaggerated faith in the discipline of science. Again, I'm not anti-scientific. I don't want anybody to walk out and be like, Oh, Jordan's one of those, you know, crazy wackies who doesn't believe in science. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying science has its limits, and scientists need to stay in their lane, just as theologians need to stay in there. All right, we will start right here because there's a lot more to say about the philosophy of science and what questions can we answer and what questions can't we. But we're out of time. All right. I gotta go. Bye.